Now we get to uh, delve into one of the most intriguing, dynamic, exciting, and somewhat confusing books of the entire Bible, the book of Revelation. So many have asked questions about what does this book mean, and I want to talk about that as we delve into a particular chapter. We're going to look at chapter 19 today, but I want to just give you an overview of what Revelation is. Revelation seems to be shrouded in mystery with all of these, all the symbolism, and you see angels, and you see living creatures, and you see thrones, and lightning, and thunder, and crystals, and all of these gemstones, and mighty rivers of water, and all of these great things, uh, the beast and the antichrist and all of it, and the question is left, what is this book all about? At its foundation. The book of Revelation gives us a glimpse of heaven. It really is a future picture of a fulfilled promise. Now, in order to understand this book, you got to go back to the first book. And it's in Genesis where God begins to give promises to Adam. He picks up those promises with Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. He continues to reiterate those promises with Moses, who was the deliverer that God used for Israel. And then he continues those promises with, with David, the great king of Israel. And all of these promises were of a Messiah, one who was going to come, who would conquer and defeat the enemies of God and secure the political peace of Israel restoring their fortunes. And Israel heard these and it gave them hope that there is one that is coming who will be rescuer, who will be restorer. They hoped in the Messiah. But what they did, the mistake that many of us make, is to only see the promises of God through a narrow earthly lens. What they didn't realize is that the first mission of the Messiah the first group of foes that he would defeat would be the enemies that separate men from God, God from men. And so when Jesus the Messiah comes, he defeats death, hell, and the grave. He lives a sinless life. He goes to that cross for you and me. He takes our sins upon him. Though we were guilty, he pays the price. And then just as he said on the third day, he rose again and with grace in his heart, in his heart and mercy in his words, he offers to you and I salvation. And how many thank God for his victory. The resurrection, the resurrection is simply the public announcement of the victory of Jesus on the cross. But then he promises he's coming back again. And when he comes back again, he will bring political fortune for the people of God as he establishes fully the kingdom of God. And all the kingdoms of this world will be given to our God and his Christ. They belong to him. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we will reign with him forever and ever and ever. And I wish I had three hours to walk you through all of that. But for now, I want you to just meditate on what that does to your heart, knowing that that is the story that you and I live in. Now, I've told you that Revelation is a complex book. Part of what makes it complex is there's many different literary styles in this book that you're going to encounter if you try to read it through on your own. Now, I'm not going to get too deep because of time into all the different literary styles, but broadly it falls up under, the book of Revelation falls up under the style of literature called prophecy. It predicts or forecasts a future day. It's called the Revelation, which that word reveal in the Greek is apocalyptus. It's where we get the word the apocalypse. It means to uncover something that's hidden. And what's been hidden from you and I, from humanity, for so long, what was hidden is the ultimate unfolding culmination of the plan of redemption that God has inaugurated for us. But what we see in Revelation is the full glory of it. We see the completion of it, the full actualization of it. In other words, we get a picture of a future day in which all the promises of God are going to be realized. 
Now, why give anyone prophecy? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. The answer is found real quickly in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. He's been doing this since chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. He's talking about the proper usage of them, the differences between them, how each one has a spiritual gift, the wrong uses of them. But then he gets to verse number 3 of chapter 14, and he says these words. On the other hand... The one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. He gives to us the reason for prophecy. What is the reason, the benefit of prophecy? To build us up, to encourage us, to console or comfort us. That can all be summed up in two words, to give us a biblical hope. Now, why do you and I need a biblical hope? Or to, a, a better question is, why did the original audience of the book of Revelation need a biblical hope? It was because God knew that they were going to go through tremendous trials and tribulations because they live in a fallen world. And that's what connects us. We need a picture of a future day for the same reason they needed a picture of a future day. It is to help us to endure the present fallen world in hope that the promise is going to be fulfilled because the promiser is worthy of our trust. All promises are based on the character of the promiser. And how many thank God that our God is a promise giver, but he even more is a promise keeper. He's worthy of our trust. They were living in a day where Nero was the emperor. If you don't know much about Nero, he was a hater of the Christian movement. And so during that time, they were imprisoned. They were thrown to the lions, fed to the lions. They were burned at the stake. Now, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. I would have to assume that for most of us, whatever it is we're facing doesn't include being thrown to the lions. I would have to assume that whatever we're going through doesn't include being burned at the stake for our faith in Jesus. For some brothers and sisters in Christ, in particular abroad, it may include imprisonment or some other form of persecution. But here's the logic, the logic of the prophecies of Scripture is that if it was strong enough to help them to endure, and trust me, it was, they endured and modeled faith so well that the more you persecuted them, the more the church grew. It was so significant and such a strong connection that it led one church father, his name Tertullian, to coin this phrase, that the blood of the martyr Martyrs are the seed of the church that literally, the more they're persecuted, the more they're multiplying disciples. How many want to have a hope that is so strong that it sustains you through all the trials of life? How many want to have a hope so deep in your heart, so strong that when um, loss or death or a rebellious child or an unfaithful spouse or persecution on your job, or betrayal, or mistreatment, or injustice, when those things encroach upon your life, that you are not overwhelmed, you don't wilt, you don't give up the faith, but you're able to be strong and to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. How many of you want to have that type of faith? Jesus' faith was so glorious, his, 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 his deity so mighty, that even on a cross, there's a Roman soldier standing by who's keeping guard, who helped to put him on that cross, and he sees him in his suffering. And I, this is amazing to me still, that he suffered in such a glorious way that this Roman soldier said this, surely this is the Son of God. I want people to be able to look at our suffering and say, surely God is with them. And so he gives us a picture of a future day so that we might be able to be encouraged today. And today God wants to encourage you. 
That's it. He wants to encourage you. But he also wants to remind you of your mission. You see, while they were going through persecution, they never lost track of their mission, which was to shine the light of Jesus, to tell everyone of his love and his grace and his truth, and to let men see their good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. I pray that we will not just be fair-weather Christians who are effective for him as long as everything is going well, but I pray that our lights will shine even brightest where things are dark and dim and not going well, that we would be at our best when things are not at their best and that we would be reminded today of our mission. Now, I went through premarital counseling when I was getting ready to uh, marry my wife. How many that are married went through premarital counseling? How many can remember those days, right? And so one of the assignments that was given to us in premarital counseling is that we had to come up with a family mission statement. And I remember us working on this and reading books. You know how it is when you're prepared, you're like a student of that thing, right? And then you realize how much you don't know once you're in it. And so uh, we, we, we worked on it. And I remember us coming up with a mission statement, but the foundation of that mission statement in my heart was uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That was the foundation of our mission statement. And we've tried to drill that in to our children and tried to allow that to influence every decision we make and everything we do. Not perfectly, but that's been the prevailing influence. Every family needs a mission statement. You have heard us who have preached before you describe the church as a spiritual family. Well, what is our mission statement? We've expressed it this way. We want to be a spiritual family of disciples who are making disciples that are making disciples that are making disciples. But here's my question. How do you know when you've made a disciple? The answer is when somebody has reoriented the worship of their lives to not worship self, not worship the world, but to worship God alone, to worship him alone. When your obedience and your allegiance is to him, and when everything you're doing is with the goal, the motivation to please him and to praise him, that's when you know you're a disciple, when somebody else is a disciple. So I'm going to give you this mission statement. It will carry throughout our series, and that's this. That our family mission statement is to spread the praise of God in our neighborhood and the nations. Among our neighbors and throughout the nations. In other words, we should not be content as long as we know there are places in this world where there are people who aren't praising God. As long as we know that there are places in this world that are experiencing the same brokenness, the same challenges, the same fallenness that we're experiencing in the world, but yet they don't have the hope that we have to sustain them, we should not be at peace with that, and we should desire that the praise of Jesus spread to every home in our neighborhood and spread throughout the nations. How many want to see that? The nations praising God. All the people groups of the world praising God. There are people groups right now that don't know the first coming of Jesus, let alone the second coming. There are people groups right now that don't know the hope of Jesus in this life and in the life to come. But you and I get a chance to be a part of the family of God. And when we live on mission, we are spreading the praise of God so that Hopefully, our neighbors will come to praise him. The nations will come to praise him, leading up to that great day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But how many don't want to wait? How many believe he is worthy of the praise today and right now? So today, I want to look at one little section of Scripture. It's a glorious section of Scripture. Revelation 19. We're going to look at the first 10 verses of Revelation 19. It is a future picture of a day that is coming called the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a wedding party that's coming that you and I are invited to attend. And I want you to think right now, how does knowing about that day affect the way I live today? And the question that's on the table is, as much as we want people to praise him, why should they praise him? 
Why should you and I praise him? Why should anyone praise God? Well, the first reason John, the revelator who writes this, he's on an island of Patmos. He's isolated in persecution, getting these visions of heaven from God. The first reason he says to praise him is because of God's character, because of his character. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says this. After this, I heard what sounded to be, what seemed to be rather, the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, crying out, Salva hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. John gets this picture of a praise party that is broken out in heaven. There is shouts of hallelujah by this great multitude. And you're going to see this throughout this chapter, these 10 verses. Hallelujah and praise is what marks every scene to the point where many commentators call this the hallelujah chorus of the Bible. There is so much praise going on in heaven over who God is. But that praise is not isolated in heaven. John is on the Isle of Patmos, so the praise that starts in heaven touches earth. And there is worship in heaven, and there is praise going on in heaven, and that should touch here in our hearts as well. We should join the angels in worshiping and rejoicing in who our God is. But what's the first reason why we should praise him? It's because of his character. Why are they saying hallelujah? Well, they tell us it's because salvation and glory and power belong to our God uniquely. What these angels are seeing, what John the Revelator are, is seeing, what we need to recognize is there are certain attributes that God has that we don't have. Historically, this has been called the omnis, that God is omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing. Omni meaning all. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He is omnipotent, all-powerful, all having all power. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Only God has those qualities. So it's like if we were uh, looking to hire God and we put together a job description, none of us would qualify because we don't have those omnis in here. Everybody understand that? If you don't, we'll pray for you after the service is over. But there are certain things that only God has. And look at what he says belongs to God. Salvation belongs to God. Now, if you don't praise him over anything else, praise him over this fact that salvation belongs to him. That means that your salvation was not put out for a democratic vote. How many thank God that it was not a popular poll that determined whether or not you should get in or not? If my salvation was based off of your vote, I may not have made it, but praise God that he is the one who controls salvation and he does it not based off of public opinion, not even based off of my merits, but based off of his grace alone. Anybody thankful for that, that your salvation is based off of his grace alone? Salvation belongs to him. Glory belongs to him. All the beauty in the world points back to God. When you see the beauty around us in a painting, in a building, in a sunset, in the sound of an ocean, when you see the beauty all around us, it belongs to him. All of it is his. The glory belongs to him. And not only that, all the power belongs to him. This is John's way of saying, praise our God because he is great. And that is sufficient. But it's not all that he is. Because he goes on to say, not only is he great, but he says his judgments are true and just, meaning he is good. Our God is great and our God is good. He is mighty and powerful, but he is righteous and just. He controls all things and he is compassionate. Over every square inch, he declares mine and he sees us in our brokenness and he heals and restores. 
God is great. God is good. So give him praise is what John is saying to us. And there are times when life doesn't feel good and you're following Jesus and you're saying, God, how does this fit into your plan? And this doesn't make sense. And what John would have us to know is this, when you cannot track his actions, trust his character. I may not know how this fits into your plans, but I know that you are good. Every parent wants their kids to trust them. There are certain times when I take my kids out, and you tell me if you're a parent or grandparent, you've experienced this before, and you got a day that's planned, and they're chomping at the bit, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And you're just saying, hey, just be patient. You're going to be happy. Don't worry about it. And they just can't wait. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And maybe you're going throughout that day, and if your kids are like mine, they get hungry, and dad, I'm hungry, and you might say, Okay, calm down. I'm going to take you. Go get something to eat. And if they're snarky like my kids get sometimes, they might say back to you, but I'm starving. Anybody ever heard that before? I'm starving. And then you respond back to them, have I ever let you starve? And if your kids are like my kids, they'll say, yes, you have. Let us starve before. You ever been through that as a mom or dad? Don't say amen. Just say ouch. <laughs> We've all been through that. And what do you want your kids to do? Just trust me. Trust my character. Trust my track record. What God is saying to you in the midst of your pain as you're saying, God, why and how? Is he saying, trust me. I'm going to care for you. This will work out for your good. Why? Because I am great. I got all power in my hand. I have not surrendered one day to the devil. I've not turned your life over to your adversary. Your enemies m won't win. Trust in me. I'm great, but I'm also good. Trust in me because everything I do is for your good. How many know that to be true and how many trust him today? <laughs> praise him for that. Then he goes on and say, praise him also, not just because of his character, but praise him for his conquest. And this is a plot twist. This is, this is a few verses that you wouldn't expect to see here, but here it is. He says, picking up in the back, last part of verse 2, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, hallelujah. There's that word again. They're praising him again. The smoke from her referring to this, this prostitute goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders... And the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who, uh, who was seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. There we go again. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Now, they're praising God because he has defeated what is referred to here as, as the prostitute. Now, this is not referring to a person. I want you to know all sin is redeemable. God can restore no matter what our backgrounds are. But this is referring to the corrupt world system that rejects the moral law of God that the kings and the rulers of this world have trafficked in, the injustices that they've trafficked in, the war, the violence the oppression so that they can gain more and more earthly power. And then subsequently, many of us have indulged in this, uh, this world system, ignoring the moral law of God, doing what seems to be profitable in the short term, thereby going into bondage. God says that's the equivalent of us inter interacting with a prostitute that charges more than what we can pay. Every time you reject God and follow your sin, you're being charged something that you can't pay, and you're pain with your soul, pieces of your soul. And what does the Bible say? What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his soul? So imagine the whole world in that bondage. Now, I want you to go back with me real quickly because the pa previous two chapters to this one speak all about God's judgment. This is what makes chapter 19 so beautiful and so glorious is that we go from judgment to celebration. But look at chapter 17 real quickly. 
verses 1 and 2, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. The kings have corrupted themselves, seeking profit, seeking their own power. And then we who dwell on earth, anytime we reject God's moral law and pursue a law that is right in our own minds but not consistent with the word, we are getting ourselves drunk off the world. And imagine being in the bondage of sin. Imagine wanting to be free from the patterns of bad decisions and the things that have destroyed your lives and then hearing these words. Go to chapter 18, verse number 1. It says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now, friends, that is worth rejoicing over because that means that the very sin and corruption that kept us in bondage is one day going to be defeated. How many praise God for that? You will not be in bondage forever. This is what John wants us to understand. Right now, those of us who are trusted in Christ, we no longer live under the power of sin and death, but we still live in the presence of sin and death. But there is a day that's coming, friends, where we will no longer live neither under the power of sin and death or the presence of sin and death, but the glory of God will reign in our hearts. Babylon's going to be defeated. Prisoners are going to go free. And all who have trusted in Jesus will share in that freedom. Oh, what a day of rejoicing. That is why they are shouting hallelujah. And that is why we too should be praising. God because salvation belongs to him and he has brought us salvation, not that we've earned it, but because of his grace and his mercy alone. If you've ever talked to somebody who's in jail who now has gone free, they will tell you there's nothing like walking out of that prison. And that's what God wants you to know. If you're in a prison of sin, you can go free. And he gives us a glimpse of that day to impact us today. You can go free today. Well, we praise him not just because of his character, not just because of his conquest, but the final verses here, we praise him because of his call. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and and his bride has made herself ready. For it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteousness, righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at the feet of Uh, at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John is so overwhelmed by what he sees that like you and I, he's just wanting to worship. You see, any vision, when you really get a vision of the glory of God, it's going to provoke you to worship. One of the ways that you know you understand the gospel is that it provokes you to worship. And so John, just in a moment where his heart is overwhelmed, gets down on his knees to get ready to worship, but he makes a mistake. He's about to worship an angel. How many know that's a mistake? We don't worship angels or saints or any of those people, right? And so here's what the angel says. This is good, good advice. The angel says, don't worship Babylon because Babylon is fallen. Don't worship the world and all of its glory. Don't worship it. It is fallen, right? And then he says, and don't worship me because I'm a fellow servant. 
The only one worthy of worship is who? God. Worship God. That's the point of the text, to worship him alone. And why should we worship him? Well, he says it's because there's a, a marriage supper that's coming, and you should worship him because you got an invite. Now, I just want to just give you a sense of this. When we were in England last, we were headed to Ethiopia. We had a layover in England, and it was just days before the new king was going to be coronated. How many follow the royal family? How many of you follow the royal family? How many don't want to admit that in public that you do? All right. All right. I don't follow the royal family closely, but my wife and my mother-in-law, uh, my mother-in-law comes from Ethiopia, a lot of British influence there. They love watching these uh, coronations and weddings, and so I've learned some things secondhand. So what I'm about to share with you is not firsthand knowledge. This is all stuff I gained by watching and talking with my beautiful wife and mother-in-law. But, but one of the things that is true is that the last royal wedding took place, listen to this, in a cathedral that only had 800 seats. Now, you know how massively popular they are. Now, 530 of those seats went to the royal family, right? Brothers, sisters, cousins, all of these grandkids, 530. If you do the math, that leaves 270 spots left. There were heads of states that didn't get invited because there's only 270 spots left. They gave some to people who worked in charities they supported, some to the general public, some to some close friends, 270. Now, let me ask you this. How do you think you would have responded if an invitation showed up at your, your, your doorstep? How excited would you guys have been? Well, maybe nobody's uh, watching the royal family over there. I'll talk to this group over here. Most, most people, most people would be excited about that. And if you didn't get an invitation, don't feel bad, neither did I. But here's the point. We have an invitation to an even greater wedding that's about to take place where the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is going to be given his bride, all the believers throughout all ages, throughout all kingdoms of the world, being brought to him. And guess what, friends? We get to sit there right next to the royal family. How many thank God for that? You've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you have trusted in Jesus, you have an invitation. But not only do you have your invitation, but God has given us invitations to pass out to our neighbors and to the nations. And the last thing you want to do is show up to that wedding and say, God, I didn't pass out these invitations for men and women to simply trust in you and by your grace be invited to this wedding supper. So friends, pass out those invitations. And if you have yet to trust in God, do it today. Don't get this close to salvation and leave without trusting in him.